For those of us who've joined us in Napa before, you know, the Beta SMB Institute Leaders Forum is special. It's a special location, a special venue, and best of all, special people. We pride ourselves on curating an A-list of attendees, the best and brightest leaders of our $500 billion plus business to small business marketplace. And every day we are adding speakers, workshops, and special events to this intimate forum, all of it highlighting the shared challenges and opportunities in a setting that drives casual and candid exchange. Join us at the 2022 B2 SMB Institute Leaders Forum, May 11th and 12th in Napa, California. Tickets are on sale now at b2smbi.com slash leadersforum22. Good day, everybody. Dave Walker here again. Um, happy to be back for another virtual event, but hopefully our last virtual event, at least for 2022, as we are going to make a, the brave attempt to return to live events here uh, at our Leaders Forum in May. More on that uh, a little bit later. But uh, every virtual event that we've done since the pandemic began in uh, early 2020, We've invited Eric Groves of uh, Alignable, the co-founder and the CEO of Alignable, to come in and talk about uh, the Road to Recovery report that he produces every single month, which is really a compilation of survey results uh, that he pulses out to uh, Alignable's many millions of small businesses. And if if somebody could write a book on the history of small business through the course of these last two years, I think it's Eric, because there's been so much data and so much uh, so much that's, that that really has been served up by these surveys on a month to month basis. And so um, I've invited two great uh, leaders in B to SMB to join us for this conversation. But let me go around and make introductions first. Uh, Co-founder CEO of Alina, Mr. Eric Groves. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for having me today. It's always wonderful to spend some time with you. And then I think one of the, um, I'll go so far as to say one of the queens of Vita SMB. She's been around in this space, serving small businesses for a very long time and making a huge impact. That's Anita Campbell of Small Business Trends. Hi, Anita. How are you? I'm doing great. And I am delighted to be here again and talk about this wonderful survey results and and uh, you know discuss small business, which is my favorite topic. It is indeed. And then last but not least, someone who is is new to this panel, um, hopefully will come back frequently uh, as we do this over the years. And that's Rich Russi, who is the editor uh, and publisher of uh, excuse me, publisher of Inc. Magazine. Hi, Rich. How are you? Hello, Dave. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited about uh, these results and uh, also talking about small business because that's all we do as well. Yep. Terrific. Well, why don't we do just quick introductions um, around the horn from you guys, starting with you, Rich, since you're new to the table. Um, can you just give us a brief background of, of where Inc. Magazine is? I'm sure most of our audience is familiar with it, but where are you guys these days? Um, and what's your role and what is your remit for 2022 and anything else you'd like to, to, to profile for us? Sure. So, so Inc., uh, what was started out as Inc. Magazine 43 years ago is now a multi-platform media company that stays to the mission that we've always had, and that's to help business owners start, run, and grow, and scale, and eventually exit their businesses. So, uh, we've been totally focused on the small business owners and, and helping them through all the, the times that, that we've seen over the last 40 years, the last two years, obviously focusing on how to get through the pandemic, how to help companies pivot. Uh, you know, we are, we are dedicated to helping companies grow. And the Inc. 5000 is our, our marquee list of those fast growth, you know, privately held companies in America. And those companies in 2021, our list that came out last year, uh, you know, they continue to grow and they added over 2 million jobs to the U.S. economy. And so, you know, what we see is that small businesses are, are still the anchor for our economy and they're the ones still hiring amidst this, you know, great resignation that we've seen over the last, last, last couple of years, people leaving jobs, but people are wanting to start uh, companies and, and do their own thing. And so, you know, we're there to, to help them and help marketers talk to these business owners because as they grow, they need more chairs, more widgets, more software, more everything. So, uh, Terrific. Anita, how about you? 
Well, I've been uh, with Small Business Trends, uh, started it actually back in 2003. I can barely believe it. So it's coming up on, on 20 years 20 pretty years. soon. Uh, but we serve small businesses, mainly the small business that uh, goes from anywhere from the solo entrepreneur all the way up to 100 employees. That's kind of our sweet spot. And that, of course, if you follow the stats, that's the majority of small businesses in the United States fall within that, that size range. And we are committed, we, our tagline is small business success delivered daily. So we're committed to bringing small business owners and the managers in small business, what they need to be successful in their business. We also have a community site, um, sister site called Biz Sugar. And uh, we have recently started a video show where we talk about the key small business issues of the week. So that's kind of what we are, uh, mainly an online business. Awesome. And Eric, as you segue into talking about the latest um, Road to Recovery report, give us a little background on yourself and on Alignable. Sure. Well, let's see. I uh, co-founded Alignable uh, about 10 years ago now, um, and Alignable is an online community. Um, we're a little over 7 million business owners across North America go to connect and build relationships with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the most important things in terms of uh, recovery and bringing customers back is referrals. And uh, what we find is, you know, the business owners on the platform leverage each other uh, they, then the relationships they build to form those relationships that lead to referrals. Um, and then they also leverage, you know, not only for customers, but, you know, the products and services, access to suppliers. And, you know, throughout COVID, we saw a massive growth in our, in our membership and engagement levels as business owners looked for ways to continue all of their offline interactions online. Um, and so, you know, it's basically resulted in us creating all kinds of industry groups and different ways that people could talk to each other. Um, to just try and help each other get through uh, the challenges uh, brought forward by COVID. And then, you know, I, it, starting uh, back in March of 2020, um, we started to collect the data. Um, so we've tracked the financial impact that COVID has had, COVID has had on the small business economy since then. Um, you know, we've reported on the number of businesses impacted. We've looked at the data by geography, by industry, uh, by many other segments, you know, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses. Um, and we've looked de deeply into the efficacy of the various relief programs that have come out, um, you know, the PPP funds and a bunch of the others. Um, and, you know, now we're really trying to sort of in this path of trying to track the slow path to recovery. Um, and, you know, I guess you could kind of look at it as we sort of take FEMA and the approach that they use to natural disasters. And we put it towards this and we say, how can we track the recovery? Um, and we've made all of our data uh, available, as you mentioned, to anybody and everyone. And you know, folks from Harvard Business School and Chicago School, um, University, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Chicago uh, have been looking at the data, the business school there to try and understand what's actually happening on a real-time basis. So it's been really great to have access to this data. Um, but most importantly, is we're trying to figure out how to mitigate um, situations that might occur like this in the future. Uh, you know, what can we put in place to help business owners actually be better prepared um, for the next time this happens? And, um, you know, I guess to sort of tee off since the last time we've talked, um, you know, the key theme uh, of discussion for today, it's really about the, um, the timing for full recovery. So what we do is we look at, we set this sort of arbitrary number of 80%. Uh, we said, you know, when will 80% of the businesses that we're surveying say that they have gotten back to the levels of revenue that they were at before COVID? And we've been tracking that. And last fall when we chatted, uh, basically the outlook was that that was going to happen in the second quarter of 2022. Well, fast forward to today, and what we've seen is this, I think we'll dive into this deeper, but this squeeze, um, uh, squeeze on revenues and, and increased costs that have resulted in that period of time getting shifted out by a year. So now that 80% are thinking that full recovery is going to happen at some point mid to end of 2023. Um, and all of that happening in the last six months. So it's pretty um, dramatic change. And, you know, we can dive into some of the, the components of that, if you'd like. 
Yeah, I, I, I would love to. I, I, you know, just off the top, I'd love to get Anita and Rich's reaction to, you know, are you seeing similar kinds of things in the audience or the small businesses that you talk to? Um, I don't know if it's fair to to say that that they characterize it as a return to noble normal. I mean, I, I, I like Eric's framing of it's really about have you, have you regained the revenue that you had before the pandemic hit? Are you at a relevant relatively equivalent level? Um, but Anita, what are you seeing from your from your chair? Well, it's like a, you know, it's sort of the haves and have nots almost, um, you know, you've got this group of businesses that some of them even thrived during COVID. <laughs> you can imagine the ones who were nimble, who thought ahead, who planned, they have done okay. And some report that it's their best year ever. Uh, and uh, last year, I think, was a telling year that if they did well and they they were, you know, doing pretty good and were profitable last year, you know, they're well positioned going forward. Then you have this other group that have still not recovered. I mean, a lot of the brick and mortar, physical based businesses still still reeling from these restrictions, and it's been very hard for them to get back to a normal situation. I would also say, and I, I think um, Eric is probably gonna talk about this, that they're also facing these pressures from first of all, not being able to get enough workers. And then secondly, inflation. Um, you know, you, Whatever you're making more now as a business, you're having to pay more to people. You're having to pay more for goods and things. Uh, and that's when you can get goods because of all the shortages. So I'm sure we'll dive into those things, but mm -hmm. we really see that dichotomy there, you know, sort of this haves and have nots is the best way I can describe it. Which is a great transition over to you, Rich. I mean, you, you talk a lot to the Inc. 5000 who arguably are, I wouldn't describe them as the haves, but certainly those who are have been historically successful, and and you characterized their last two years as actually being pretty darn good. Um, was it because they were so well positioned and and didn't and were able to deflect a lot of the challenges that Anita and Erica were referring to, or uh, were they just lucky? Were they in the right categories? What, what do you what do you ascribe it to? It, it's probably a combination of those things. Some some were very lucky. Some were smart and pivoted their businesses uh, when they saw the opportunity of, of what was happening. And and some you know not all of them were so good. You know, in twenty the first year of the pandemic when our, our list came out, it didn't really reflect the the pre pandemic kind of or it reflected the pre pandemic. And, and so their growth was before the pandemic. And, and when they got named to the list they had gone through a time where they may have had to lay off employees and now they're coming onto the list and they, they, they felt weird about it because the people that helped them get there were no longer with the company because you know they had to, to make decisions to keep the company going and, and you fast forward and and a lot of them have been able to hire back and, and things like that and I think Anita hit it right on the head is, is you know they're trying to keep their employees happy and and the different kinds and it depended on the kinds of businesses that they were the brick and mortars definitely got hit the hardest uh and and what we saw was if they were able to pivot and you know implement technology and e-retailing e and, and things like that faster uh they got through it a little better uh a lot of them suffered and then you know keeping employees during this time was one of the biggest challenges that they all faced uh, a lot of people left their jobs and and the business owner doesn't have that luxury uh, when their employees are leaving, how do they, you know, hire new talent and, and train during a time when some companies are all remote? Uh, so a lot had to learn a lot of different things over the course, and and some remained remote. Uh, you know, they they took it as, hey, I just saved, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on on office space because now we're all remote and we're able to do the same thing. So it just re really depended on on those business owners, owners, you know, being able to pivot quickly uh, for that success and, and not, you know, as Adina said, not all of them, you know, found that success because it's it was tough times. Eric, have, um, have do, this, do the most recent surveys suggest that uh, two, two challenges that Anita and Rich both, both brought up, the challenges of inflation, and the challenges of employment, uh, finding the right people, have those effectively supplanted concerns about COVID that were so easy to basically pin in the early stages of the pandemic? Or is it, it, 
what's the balance basically of concerns now, I guess, is my question. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the, the number one concern is clearly inflation, but I think it, it does help to kind of look at it from both sides of the equation. Um, if you start off on the revenue side, um, we had seen going into the fourth quarter some pretty decent recovery where customers were coming back, revenue was coming back. Um, and, you know, most notably in, in some of those industries that have been hardest hit, which are personal services personal contact and, and manufacturing as well has been, you know, from the supply chain and also the employee side. Um, and what we saw at the end of the year was this oddball thing, Omicron come, comes out of nowhere and um, causes a lot of uh, anxiety because of the unknown. And what it did was it basically stalled the recovery that we were on and um, hit those industries, which were in many ways the most um, challenged, the personal services and, and the manufacturing, um, where they couldn't get access to their labor and they had consumers that were you know, scared about coming in again. And so what we see right now is about 43% of the businesses saying that their revenue level is 50% or less than it was pre-COVID. And that's really disconcerting. And if you look at the industries and the segments um, where that is most acute, you know, clearly in those personal services, also minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses taking the brunt of a lot of this, this impact. Um, so there's no, no doubt that Omicron factored into this, um, the recovery challenge on the revenue side. Now, as we sort of get to the back side of that, the hope is that the revenues start to climb again. Um, but on the other side of the equation, on the expense side, you now have these two um, you know, challenges uh, around inflation and employees, which are both contributors to the bottom line, right? In terms of you know, how much uh, from an inflation standpoint, how much has it gone up and how much can you pass along to your customers? Um, and what we're seeing is 91% of businesses saying that they've experienced higher cost and 40% saying that their costs have risen, risen over 25%. So a significant portion of the businesses that are out there are clearly being impacted on the cost side and by the supply side. And then you add to that the people that are actually trying to hire and the fact that 65% of businesses who are looking to hire are finding it very challenging to actually get access to new employees. And if they can find them, the fact that their wages that they're having to pay are higher as a 60% of businesses are saying they're paying more for employees than they did pre COVID. So you take those two things with the revenue getting squished and the expenses getting larger, and clearly the bottom line is impacted, which means less money flowing to the bottom to service debt and anything that you've incurred to try and get through the crisis, longer repayment times and a, a slower path to recovery. And that's why we're seeing it push out by over a year. The push out over a year is a little daunting, um, to say the least. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I personally struggle with the dichotomy of, of articles that you see about the state of small business. On any given day, any given week, as we're producing our newsletter, I would say about half the stories that we curate from across the web are incredibly optimistic and positive. God, it's fantastic out there. And then the other half are deeply pessimistic, are deeply dark as in like, we're still headed over a cliff. So it's it's challenging. But I'm sure that Anita and Rich, you guys see, you know, similar, um, the positive and the negative of, of the kind of the state of small business. You both have large writing staffs, editorial contributors. Um, I want each of you to kind of take in turn. Rich, what are you, what are you and your writing team basically focused on as far as solutions to inflation or the management of inflation impact? And then Anita, in turn, what's your team really focused on as far as talent acquisition and employment and those particular challenges? And you can flip it if you guys want to, if you're more comfortable with one or the other. But um, Rich, let's start with you and just this challenge of inflation. Inflation, it's real. And and are again it's going to depend on the type of company and, and i think inflation if you're you're selling certain kinds of products it's 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 doubled with in, in fact the, the whole supply chain problem so even if you're selling a product you can't get enough of that product to get to market you know and so you're paying more for the product and it's taking longer to even get it uh so 
you have you have that as well, uh, kind of coupling some of the, these companies that they, you know, you can you can go and order something online, and now sometimes as a, as a customer, it takes weeks where it used to take a few days. Uh, so so companies you know need to 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 budget in for that and and try to to figure that out. Um, but inflation is real, so that in 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 turn they're going to have to try to cut costs, uh, and and it's it's a tough kind of mix and so a lot of them are trying to find different kinds of financing and you're seeing a lot of that opportunity coming with companies in the financial arena you've never seen before uh, that are giving out small business loans and, and trying to help um, and and I think depending too we, we just started a whole new uh, area on our website called all the hats which is really focused on black female entrepreneurs who face challenges of you know being a woman being black getting financing there, there's a lot of issues and it, it, it's all written and, and, and curated by a, a great female entrepreneur. So we're, we're trying to, to you know, help all these kinds of companies because the challenges are different from every company and, and inflation is something that we're all facing as, as small businesses. And I think that's something that, that we need to worry about costs and everything else, but the supply chains have to get up and running too for these companies. Right. And Anita, how about you on the, the whole acquisition of talent? Well, you know, one of the good things about small businesses is that we've always been nimble and very flexible in our working conditions. And I, I think that's always been a real advantage over some larger companies, if you will. Um, what we lack in benefits, we're able to do in providing, um, you know, family friendly work hours and conditions and so on. But I think small business owners have been challenged to take that even to another level. And, and that has, um, you know, I think really pressured some small business owners and specifically managers in small businesses, because a lot of managers have had to learn how to manage differently. Um, you know, when you think about businesses, as, as you know, Rich talked about earlier, who may have decided, well, you know, we've, we're saving money by going remote with our workforce. Maybe we'll just stay remote or have a large chunk of it be remote. And that's a very different management task from managing somebody who's there in front of you. And a lot of managers only know how to manage people and train them and deal with them if they're right there. So it really has required, I think, these managers to up their skill levels. They've had to rely on technology more to, to do things, maybe to communicate more. I think having a digital workspace is more important than ever. You know, you need a place for people to congregate and a place for managers to be able to communicate with people on a regular basis. And, you know, I, I think uh, some small businesses try to get by with just doing that through email and maybe instant messenger like Skype or something like that, uh, chat, um, maybe uh, phone, but you really need a place where people can find things and share things that mimics being in a real office. And so all these things are real challenges, I think, for the small business owner, you know, not just finding the people, but when you have them, how do you deal with them? And, uh, you know, and I think that's where companies can really help. If you can provide that kind of technological support, you know, large businesses that have solutions for small businesses, you know, help them learn how to manage their people at a distance, how to deal with their people. I, I think that's going to be crucial. So Eric, one of the things that you provide every month, in addition to the actual, the, the data, the cumulative data, kind of the quantitative look, is you provide actually a tremendous qualitative look in, in, in quoting many of the ver verbatims that come back from the survey. What are the some, what are some of, on this whole package of concerns that small businesses are, are articulating, particularly in these big three areas of COVID and inflation and, and talent acquisition, what are some of the verbatims that stand out to you of, of things that really articulate or capture really well what the state of mind is right now for small business? Um, well, you know, I, I think this, or the, this, you know, there's sort of these two worlds, really, right? And there's people that have been hit by this pretty significantly. And, um, you know, the, the heads up on that gave me enough time to actually pull up that report and go look for one. So thanks. On that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I'm sorry, you know, here, 
So here's an example of someone, you know, who says, you know, the supply chain uh, issues have impacted everyone. People are confused, not sure what to do. Morale is low, but we are learning how to cope as prices continue to rise, right? And that kind of sums it up in, in a way where it's like they realize that they're in this with others. Um, they're finding ways to cope. And, you know, it was interesting with Anita sort of saying, finding a way to actually, um, you know, interact with other people. You know, 81% of all small businesses are solos. And so, you know, one of the wonderful things that we've seen on Alignable is the sharing of knowledge, right? You know, with a, with a full team of people, if I have a mar marketing challenge, I can go talk to the marketing team. As a small business owner, I need to be able to go talk to people. And so what we've seen is this sort of massive interest in groups, um, whether it's a topic group, like how do I access um, capital as a minority owned business, or, you know, we have a florist group where they're struggling to get access to supplies and they're actually across the country sharing information about different suppliers that they're using, that they're getting access to product through. You know, that breaking down those barriers and giving people a place where they can actually go talk to each other is, is critical for the information to flow and for the, the, the system to start spinning again. And we've seen that in just you know, thousands of different groups being created and different types of networking where people just want to go to a networking event and um, do almost like you know, speed dating through Zoom and just meet other business owners and say, well, what challenges are you dealing with? And, and, and be able to sort of vent and, and, and be with other people that are going through similar challenges. So we see a lot of that in the, in the different you know, quotes that we get of people realizing it's challenging. I mean, small business owners are wonderful. I mean, they're the most entrepreneurial people there are out there. They're gonna find a way through. Um, and you know, going back to the statement earlier about the, the haves and the have nots, the most important thing that we can encourage people to do who are on the have side is to realize that there are the have nots and don't go spend your money on Amazon, go spend it with those other businesses that could benefit from the, your, you know, the fortunate situation. Um, and you know, we'll get through this and they'll get through this together, but the, the most important piece is the together, I think. Um, that's a great segue again to, to uh, another question. I'll, I'll serve it up as a jump ball. Are consumers, have consumers over the last two years with an attention to the struggles that small businesses were, were going through, have they started to change their behavior? Have they started to move share of their wallet by, by, from your vantage points into spending at small business? Or is that still kind of a uh, a mythical beast that really has not actually, you know, appeared yet. Rich, you can go first. I think it probably the, it's a geographic thing in a lot of ways. I think if you live in a town where there are the mom and pop shops, you want to support them uh, and restaurants and th things like that. I, I believe it's, it's probably doesn't uh, keep people away from the big box kind of stores, you know, to, Get, get some of their supplies, but I do think people, especially I've seen in our town over the last year, have been trying to support the local businesses a lot more. Uh, but I, I think it is, it's a geographic thing. And, and if, if you don't really have access and you're used to going to the big strip malls and, and things like that, uh, your probably habits haven't changed. And because of inflation, the consumer is seeing prices rise. And so they're going to, you know, go where the, the price is the best for them as a consumer. How about you, Anita? Well, I would also add to that, that, um, you know, we've seen how these marketplaces online have grown. So look at Amazon, for example. Amazon has really got to focus on small business, and they talk a lot about how they're an outlet for small business retailers, uh, for small business service providers even. I mean, you can just get about anything on, on Amazon and things you don't even think about. The drivers of the Amazon trucks are, are basically owners of, of small businesses. And, and there are many ways that small businesses are actually part of what on the surface looks like a big company, but they're actually you know, part of it underneath. They're, they're actually using that platform. And you see this a lot. It's not just with that. You see it with Etsy. You see it elsewhere. Um, so it's sometimes hard to tell 
whether or not small businesses are actually getting more support. Um, we do know that those who are selling on these big platforms, you know, a lot of them are doing really, really well. Um, so that's um, something to consider. Yeah, I, I, we, we actually just have an article today in our, in our newsletter. Um, it was a research done on the cost of advertising on Amazon for small business. And the cost has gone up in the last six months by 27%. So, you know, talk about inflation, and that's obviously far, far, far past any kind of genuine inflation that Amazon needs to pass along to its small business customers. But I, I at least personally, have noticed as a consumer that um, the number of sponsored items or advertised items that appear in any search that you do on Google is vastly greater than, I, than it's ever been before. I mean, it, it, it consumes almost the entirety of the first page. It's a little bit of a Google Googleification, if that's a word, of how uh, you know what you what you see in that first page uh, being paid for. Eric, back to you. I know you care very passionately about money that stays local with small businesses. Are you seeing any uh, turn of the worm as far as consumer behavior? Um, not yet. I mean, we're still seeing you know the slow recovery of the consumers coming back, um, but nothing dramatic yet. We're hoping that in the next edition. Um, that we do in March, that we'll start to see it, basically seeing if the Omicron sort of spike is now caused people to kind of return. I think a lot of these businesses, um, the personal services businesses that are um, significantly hit, um, do better when the weather gets nicer. Um, mm -hmm. So as we're coming into the, the late spring and early summer, you know, the hope is that we'll start to see um, similar climb that we saw last year in terms of revenue and customers coming back. Um, but, you know, I think the, the Amazon thing about small businesses on there being, you know, is, is important to recognize, but also recognize that Amazon then gets access to all the data and Amazon uses that data to their benefit. Um, mm -hmm. So even though you're selling on there, if they see a decent margin somewhere, you can be damn sure that Amazon's going to be offering that product soon. Um, so, you know, it, it's a double edged sword. It's, it's, it's a place where, you know, many business owners have to go. Um, but also recognize that they are a data machine and they're leveraging that data to their own benefit. Um, and then I guess the other you know, other one here is I, I was looking through the quotes, um, was a business in the healthcare space, right? Where um, she eloquently says, uh, we're in healthcare, so volume is up and we're doing well revenue wise, but staffing is down and one plus two equal a recipe for burnout. Um, and so there you have not only revenue being great, but the labor shortage causing significant um, challenges for a business. Um, and it's just another example that you can't use the same formula for every business. Um, and some of the revenue is great and the, the expenses are under control and, and in others, it's a completely different situation. So Rich, back to you, are there, um, you know, we've talked about uh, content related to inflation or talent acquisition or, um, those kinds of mainstream, I don't want to call them mainstream, but those big items that are really on everybody's I want to know more list. Are there some some things that are kind of a little bit more off track, maybe off the beaten path that you really are starting to see as topics that your editorial staff are bringing to you or that your your readers are saying, gee, I really would like you to write about. And I'll just give you a for instance, I, I've seen just started to see an emerging uh, stream of content around the mental health of small business. How do you keep your mental health in these incredibly challenging, stressed out, you know, recipe for burnout kind of environments? Are there any other topics like that, that, that your team is bringing to you? Well, you bring up mental health. That, that, that's a huge issue for big and small business, especially with the remote working thing where, where people and employees are, are they're finding it a harder time now to separate life and, and you know professional and personal lives because it's all happening in the same place. Uh, we see it especially amongst the, the younger workers who live in, especially in, in bigger cities, they live in small apartments and, and the first year of the pandemic when they couldn't go anywhere, the mental health issues rose dramatically. And, and I think that's something in, companies are, are very uh, attuned to now and in, in trying to make sure that the that those things are, are attributed. And a lot of companies, startups are coming up in this space because uh, it, it's important for, you know, the mental health of their employees because they are reaching burnout that, that you know, so we're, we're covering that a lot now uh, in, in the different ways. Technology has been a big uh, help in terms of getting information to employees and getting them 
in groups and, and, and being able to discuss these issues because it, it it's tougher when you're you know sitting in your apartment. So a lot of companies are trying to come back now, knowing that the work life balance is important, but people also like working from home. So they don't necessarily love going to the office. So the, I think what we're seeing a lot and we're starting to write about more is, is how do you implement a hybrid model into your, your workforce? And, and that there are times when we can get together and, and strategize as a group in person to keep that, you know, that, that human touch, if you will, going, uh, but also allow employees to, to attend their kids' soccer games that they got used to going to over the last few years and, and doing all those things right. uh, that they found now is really important in my life. But I also understand I need to, you know, communicate with my teams and, 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 and vice versa. So I think that that's, that's a big issue for us now. And, and we're seeing it uh, all, in a lot of the articles that were, you know, how can you, how can you maintain that balance now that employees got used to over the last two years? Anita, how about you? Well, we're seeing a lot more interest in um, <clears throat> uh, buying and selling businesses and succession planning, for example. So I think during uh, you know, the past couple of years of COVID, a lot of business owners who might've been uh, thinking about exiting their business, they had to put those plans on hold. I mean, they, you, know, you couldn't find buyers in such uncertain times. And of course, uh, you weren't going to get the kind of price that you wanted. So now I think what we're seeing is that is loosening up and there's more interest in that now and business owners that were on that cusp, let's say, of considering that can actually get back to that. They can think about, well, I can go into my succession plans. If I have plans of you know, developing some of my employees to become uh, higher level leaders, possibly transitioning the business to them or just finding a third party buyer, you know, they're able to think about that again. And so that was one of the things that, you know, I found pretty interesting that, and we're seeing from the statistics that, you know, uh, buying and selling businesses are up uh, pretty significantly. So, you know, I think it's just pent up demand and that fact that we're getting through this period, you can think about it again. Interesting. Eric, you, Alignable has deservedly um, grown its membership enormously, you know, since the pandemic began. Are you yet seeing the voices of these uh, four and a half million new small businesses yet appear in your membership ranks? I mean, are you starting to see, oh, there they are. Um, I, I have not personally seen a lot of really good stu studies that dig underneath the small business applications that kind of come through government and corporation forms, that kind of thing. I haven't seen a lot of good data that digs into who exactly are these four and a half million people that have started businesses? Are, are you starting to see any evidence of those folks? We definitely see them coming in. We don't have any sort of, you know, specific data where we capture when did you start your business or when did you buy mm -hmm. your business? Um, <clears throat> but it was interesting, Karen Mills, who was the head of the Small Business Administration under Obama, <clears throat> wrote a, a recent uh, book about financing um, business, was pointing out that there's sort of this, um, big burst uh, in potential people selling businesses who are baby boomers and millennials who want to actually buy into a business. And um, those are both like sort of coming to a head at the same time. And mm -hmm. you know, she was saying in the next 10 years, she anticipates a significant, um, uh, just as Nita was saying, uh, change in the ownership where the baby boomers are getting out of the business and the millennials are coming in and buying into these businesses. Um, and uh, so it was very encouraged about the, the business starts side and, and sort of the growth in small business that's coming in the next, you know, five to 10 years. Um, so, you know, we're, we're certainly, you know, looking to create groups around those topics. Um, but, you know, it is interesting to see them, you know, they're looking more into buying businesses than actually starting them on their own um, because they have access to the capital um, in many situations. And so that sort of bodes well for those folks that are looking to try and get out and, um, you know, sell off their business at this point. Rich, seeing any evidence in your audience that those, those uh, new businesses are picking up Inc. as a brand they can trust to learn about how to start and grow their small business? Yeah, I, I think it's all, again, it's part of what we work, we call that the great resignation, which we also write a lot about of people leaving corporate jobs and they are looking for that. So we are seeing that 
that that group is is coming in. And one of the things we talk about a lot too is is understanding the purpose of your business and and the power of that purpose. And I'm not talking about the the you know a lot of companies are are, are giving back to communities, but the purpose of what your company or the company you're going to buy you want to go into, understand the purpose and, and the the mission of the company and and, and their products or, or services. Um, you know, a great example is if, if, you know, back in the day, if, if Kodak realized their real purpose was about holding on to memories and, and giving people access to memories, and, and instead of being a, a company that printed pictures on paper, they probably would have had a different outcome because they sold digital photo technology really early in the process because they thought, ah, we, we put pictures on paper, there's no need for this. And they really sold a technology that would have you know, launch them into the future. So the purpose of these companies and businesses is, is really important now for that business owner or new business owner to come in and say, what is the purpose of what we're doing here? And, and it translates then to their employees and everything else. And Anita, how about in, in your world, seeing evidence of this, uh, this uh, community of new small businesses coming? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I think there is a, this resurgence of you know, interest in like starting a business and, you know, how do you, how do you do the basics in a business, you know, because you, you've just got this whole new crop of people, uh, you know, I, I think as uh, Rich was saying, you, you had these people who maybe they're in the corporate world and they were forced to be home and then they realized, wow, I like it at home. You know, I can, I can integrate my personal life with my business life much better. You know, my quality of life is so much better. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have to struggle dealing with um, childcare issues and having to leave, you know, and having a long commute to get to pick up the kids after, you know, school or daycare or whatever. And so now they're examining their lives and saying, hey, I just want that all the time. So what kind of work situation is going to let me have that kind of integration? Mm -hmm. And so they turn to entrepreneurship. And, and so there's just, you know, I think, um, I think it goes hand in hand with people just leaving these jobs, you know, they still have to earn money somehow. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like they're, you know, independently wealthy necessarily. Um, they're, you know, they've got to learn, they've got to earn somehow, but they're thinking, well, you know, if I work from home and, uh, you know, I don't have these uh, costs of commuting and, you know, maybe, um, you know, the, the higher costs of childcare and so on, because I'm here, maybe just maybe I can get by with a startups kind of income. And so, yeah, definitely, definitely seeing that. And the, and the rise of the freelance worker, I think, is, is coming out of this, too. You're seeing companies like Upwork and Fiverr that, that I can work out of home, but I can do a little job here and a little job there. And, and, and folks are kind of accumulating these, these freelance kind of opportunities into to a career. And and no absolutely no doubt doubt and I would I would include contractor works workers yeah. and um, people stringing together uh, particularly you know those who are exiting corporate jobs who, who want a particular or need a particular level of income uh, a different kind of gig worker you know someone who really is stringing together two or three big jobs um, that they're working on so that they can uh, replicate at least a portion of their um, a custom revenue stream as it were. Um, terrific guys. I mean, so much, I, we, we could go on for hours about this. Why don't we wrap up though, by, uh, I know that each of you are kind of launching into, you know, or currently launching into, or about to launch into some pretty big, you know, initiatives on behalf of your brands and on behalf of, 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 uh, you know, what you deliver and what you offer, starting with you, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about what Alignable has really kind of lining up to deliver in 2022? Uh, some of the things that are kind of in play, in place and coming along? Sure. You know, I think one of the key things that's kind of grown out of this group um, interactivity between people. And what we found is that you know, businesses want to get ideas on what they should be doing, products, services they should be using from each other. Um, and we've always sort of kept uh, the brands, I guess, at bay from accessing the platform. Uh, but we're actually rolling out a pretty deep marketplace now around the key pain points that businesses have so they can learn about you know the challenges of how do i get access to a loan um, they can come to events that are 
um, with thought leaders in a specific topic area. Um, we, you know, we've had events with you know five thousand attendees um, to some of these uh, events that we've been running, and you know, there it's sort of a discussion around. Um, well, how do you? How do I think about accessing capital? What are the different things that I could be using? And so, using sort of thought leaders and bringing them into a place where they can educate, and then um, buttressing that up with solutions uh, in a marketplace. So we're actually rolling out those marketplaces. We've launched one for hiring, access to capital, social media, email marketing. You know, all the pain points that businesses really have. We're kind of marching our way through them to try and pull together um, this really unique. Um, uh, solution that leverages our, our value proposition, which is, you know, not only discovering, but being able to talk to people about the solution before you go and buy um, through these groups. And so that's, that's pretty exciting. And that's rolling out throughout the rest of this year. That's awesome. And Anita, how about you? I know um, the, the subscriber base is growing. I know that Biz Sugar is growing. Uh, talk to us a little about, about the vodcast you guys are starting to, to, to do. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, about uh, like a deeper look at certain issues that people might have. Um, you know, we uh, recently did a show on uh, the FTC's crackdown on review sites and, you know, what that means for either the business that is, wants to get its product reviewed or uh, those who might be running a review site or have review sites. So it's that kind of thing where we take an issue and we really want to delve into it a little little bit more. Uh, we're also finding that, uh, you know, we're just creating more content for the new business owner to feed this interest of those who are just starting a business or, you know, the gig worker, the freelancer. I mean, you know, what, whatever, they may be new to running their own business. So a lot of times they need some basic information. And we tend to forget, you know, we, you know, especially like me, I, I've been looking at this information for years and years, you know, almost two decades now. And I think, oh, that's so basic. Nobody could could want to know that. And then I'm always shocked when, you know, it's like you make it simple for people. And they're like, yeah, I get it now. That's that's what I need to know. And then, you know, hopefully provide some community where they can discuss things in a little bit more depth, but you give them the basics and then they can discuss more, they can delve a little bit more into it. You know, like Eric was talking about, you know, just community of sharing ideas. I mean, people need that, you know, business owners need it way more than people in corporations because you can't walk down the hall and talk with a colleague. You, you know, you just can't. So you're going to go online and you got to look for like-minded people online. That's terrific. Rich, how about the uh, the Inc. family? What do you, what's on your guys' horizon? Well, we're, these guys said it best. It's for us, uh, as we look at, at 2022, it's, it's about the community. And it's about the, the community of business owners from, from you know, the solopreneurs on, on up. And, and, you know, our goal, and we're so excited to be back live, as, as you mentioned, you're going live again, you know, later in the year. Uh, but we'll be live at, at South by Southwest with our founders house, which, you know, we, we had a now I guess three year hiatus. And, and so bringing these community of business owners together where they can network and, and nothing is, is more engaging to a business owner than speaking to another business owner and, and about their challenges and their problems. And it, entrepreneurs are unique. They, they really want to help each other because they, they, they see a benefit in that. And I, and so you know, we're, we're live at South by Southwest. We're, we're going back to doing some live events throughout the year. And of course, our marquee event in October, the Inc. 5000, will be back to live, bringing 2,000, you know, highly successful, fast growth, you know, owners in into, into Phoenix. And, and, you know, that's where I, we see all these things happen. And, and they just, you know, the, the ideas that they have and, and the, the need to, to communicate with each other is, is so deep. And we saw it. We, we did a couple small events just kind of, testing the waters in the fall and and, and they were more, far more successful than we thought they'd be in terms of turnout and and the people just wanting to get out again and, and talk to fellow business owners um you know virtual was a great pivot and and we're still doing it and i think we now have a nice balance i think going forward of your c events like this as well as the live events uh, coming into play so i'm very excited what 22 brings yeah, so so am I, and I, it sounds like all of you guys are. I appreciate all this tremendous conversation around um, this incredibly valuable tool that we have at our disposal in the uh, Lineable Road to Recovery report 
that really should be must reading. You should subscribe to it if you're not subscribing to it already. You should be ashamed of yourself if you're in the business to small business space and you don't subscribe to this to this blog. It's a, it's it's really incredibly valuable. Rich for a rookie, damn good man. You know you you really you brought you brought it. No question about it. Thank you very much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. It's the company. It's the company you keep. <laughs> exactly. And Anita, as always, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And great to be here with, <laughs> with the others as well. So thank you. And then Eric, um, continued success, my friend. Uh, you know, you what you're doing is really, as I tell you repeatedly, it is the Lord's work. <laughs> and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks. Thanks. Always a pleasure to be here and great to be with all of these folks. And Rich, welcome to the team. It's great to have Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Great. Thanks very much, guys.